Hi guys, it's me Chazer HD and welcome to another episode of the podcast where today we're basically going to review what happened in the 2019 US Grand Prix in Austin, Texas at the Circuit of Americas and I'm pleased to have Nib back on today for the podcast and Nib, how you doing mate and how have you been able to catch up on what happened on Sunday? Well, obviously, as you just know, uh, the only um, the amount that I've watched of the race is the highlights on the YouTube channel. I haven't been able to go back and watch the race whatsoever as I've been very busy today um, with my exam. So, yeah, I haven't been able to watch or catch too much, only the highlights. But, yeah, of course, Hamilton, um, six-time world champion, now absolutely insane. And, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get a little bit more into that as we as we go. Absolutely, and we'll just go straight into the big news from that race that Lewis Hamilton is the six-time world champion. Great drive by Hamilton to keep Max Verstappen behind um, and to pull off the one-stop and almost uh, win the race, actually, because he was hanging on for quite a bit against teammate Valtteri Bottas. But second place, still a great drive considering what he did in qualifying. But yeah, he is the 2019 world champion and has really dominated the championship really since the Spanish Monaco Grand Prix time. So great season and he thoroughly does deserve to win the title in Nib. Uh, for Lewis Hamilton, how would you describe his season and how do you think, um, or rather what do you think were the key things for Hamilton to win this season? Uh, that he just drove and didn't crash. I, I honestly felt <laughs> as if we didn't see ha Lewis Hamilton anywhere near his best uh, for the majority of the season, and he doesn't need to be anywhere near his best to win the to win the championship against uh, against his teammate Valtteri Bottas. Um, you know, and and that's not a dig on Bottas. That's just how good Hamilton is. Hamilton just he he makes it look easy with um just how easily he gets those results every week. You know, he have he have a bad qualifying, and I thought that uh when I seen the qualifying results and he was starting fifth, I'm like, oh Hamilton will win, and he nearly ended up winning of the race. Of course, um, you know he in the race his race pace is just absolutely insane. That that's where Hamilton really is um has got the edge on everyone else i feel is his race pace you, you've seen bottas especially in the first half of the season get really close and beat hamilton quite often in qualifying but it was always in the race or in the start that hamilton just had the edge and then was able to maintain the race and we've always said that sebastian vettel's is such a great manager of the race and he, he almost ally like alan pross well i think lewis hamilton is just as good at, at managing a race at the front i don't think as soon as as soon as Hamilton gets in front, he just manages the race exactly like Vettel and like Prost did, and he certainly is one of the best at it. And now we're, we're going to see next season Hamilton break many many more records, in my opinion. Yeah, I think if the car remains as good as it is, and he keeps up this high level, which he will for another few years, if he does decide to stay in Formula One for another few years, then yeah, Lewis Hamilton. Is in a great position to break records, to win more than seven world titles, and to, of course, break the wins record of Michael Schumacher. And for Hamilton this season, I am doing a video on Lewis Hamilton in a couple days about how the title was won in a much more detailed way. But for a summary, as Nib said, when it came to the races, even though most, not most of the time, but quite a lot of the time, Hamilton was not getting qualifying together in the way he would have liked to, but in the race when it mattered most, at the start of races, around the pit stop phases, or when it came to when he had to make an overtake, Lewis Hamilton made it work, and that is mostly the reason why he is your 2019 World Champion, uh, champion. and congratulations once again to him. Now, let's move on to Ferrari. Because Ferrari were absolutely awful in the race. They didn't have an overall, I would say, awful weekend because qualifying was not too bad for them. But the race was simply horrific. And I'll throw up on the screen um, as I talk about Ferrari and as we talk about Ferrari, the race results to show you how far Charles Leclerc was behind the race winner and to show the lap time differences between Leclerc and Bottas in the first stint. Leclerc was lapping at best a second to even a second and a half a lap off the pace. That is highly embarrassing for Ferrari. It was an absolute horror show in terms of speed. Of course, Sebastian Vettel had his 
uh, suspension failure. We still don't quite know at the time of recording what actually caused it. We know that it was the uh, the curb, I think, at turn nine that finished it off, but we don't know exactly the build-up to that, what happened to cause it to eventually fail, because Matai Bonotto came out and said that Vettel had that problem since the first lap, and it was pretty clear to see, considering he dropped from P2 down to seventh uh, position. But for Ferrari, uh, Nib, the pace, I mean, we know they have race pace that is not good compared to how they can do in qualifying. But this was, I mean, you said before we started recording, it was literally as bad as the Hungarian Grand Prix, wasn't it? Well, yeah, from from obviously what I've seen, and that's a, a timing screen of, of the race result, uh, for Leclerc to be, what was it, 52 seconds off the lead? Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that that's not fantastic, is it? And of course, um, as you said, you were mentioning during the race that Ricardo was closer to uh, Leclerc than what Leclerc was to Verstappen um, up in third place. And I think that tells you uh, all you need to know, really, that Ferrari were just absolutely, utterly abysmal. Yep, they absolutely were. And if this doesn't get fixed into 2020, I just don't see how Ferrari can even hope to contend for the World Championship because you can lock out the front row or be on the front row as many times as you want. But if you're going to be this far off the pace in the race, then there's no real chance of contending. So Ferrari have got to somehow fix this problem because, again, if you have a very quick car in qualifying... It doesn't matter if this is the pace you have on the day where points are scored. Uh, but also with uh, Sebastian Vettel's uh, uh, suspension failure, let's get into that a bit more. Now, there are a couple things that may have caused it, such as the bumps at the track, uh, the uh, curbs or the uh, sausage curbs may have also had an effect on his suspension. Now, Nib, I know you saw a bit of practice and uh, summer qualifying. Do you think that the track, in terms of the bumps and the curbing and the runoff areas, do you think the track needs to be improved? Because it did prove to be quite a, a controversial and quite difficult uh, thing over the weekend. Well, I think they've already announced that they're going to resurface the track. Um, yeah. And in time for next year's race, so I think that um, I think that they've certainly made the right decision by doing that because yeah, it was extremely extremely bumpy from any footage that I watched um during the weekend, mainly practice one, um out out of turn two, oh my goodness, the amount of bumps! It looks like the cars are going to bounce up off of the air. It was that bad. Um, but yeah, I think that also in just in a little a tiny little bit of Ferrari's defence, they've struggled at at tracks where there's where it's been quite significantly bumpy this year and they've had brought quite a stiff setup because uh if you go back to australia that's where they really struggled was with the bumps and i think we've seen it a little bit more um as well again this weekend they weren't maybe expecting it to be as bumpy as what it was so their setup was quite close and they couldn't perhaps get it in the window of course in qualifying that wasn't uh, particularly restricting them but in terms of the race and then uh, managing the tyres, I think that certainly affected them a little bit more than what are uh, than what they thought going into the weekend. Yeah, I think that definitely did have an effect. Um, I th I still think for the race it was probably still the inability to look after their tyres. And Charles Leclerc was saying that the tyres, the medium tyres he started on, felt horrible in that first stint of the race. Now, also another thing to come out from the weekend about Ferrari is this whole engine situation. Now. I'll quickly go over this. Now, the FIA gave out a technical directive about what you're allowed to do, I think, with the fuel or fuel flow after Red Bull asked the FIA what, you know, what is the situation here. And according to Red Bull and Mercedes, Ferrari's top speed wasn't quite there. Now, if you do look, and I'll show them on the screen right now, the speed traps in qualifying and the second sector um, in qualifying as well the second sector of course is where all of the power zones really are in the sectors at this track ferrari were definitely not as quick as they should have been considering how quick they've been on the straights before this grand prix so definitely there was an issue there 
Maybe they were losing a bit too much time in the corners in that second sector. Who knows? But down the straight, they definitely were not pulling the speed they normally do or were expected to in this Grand Prix weekend. Now, I'm not going to say right now whether this technical directive has actually hurt Ferrari's uh, power unit or engine advantage because we can't really tell around a track like the Circuit of Americas. Let's wait until the next race in Interlagos because that's a power track. And if Ferrari in the first and third sector and in the speed traps in qualifying, for, for example, are still not that quick compared to how we expect them to be, then, you know, something has definitely happened to hurt their advantages in a straight line. So we'll wait until the Brazilian Grand Prix. So now we're going to get into the midfield. And first off, we'll start off with Daniel Ricciardo. Of course, Nib, you support him. Um, and Ricciardo really had a great weekend. Qualifying ninth, I think he did the best he could really with the car. And then in the race, finishing at the front of the midfield battle and just about hanging on ahead of Lando Norris. A great race by him. Uh, what did you think of Ricciardo's performance during the weekend? Um, well, honestly, I didn't pay too much attention. Uh, certainly during practice, I, I honestly can't remember where Ricardo qualified. Um, if I'm perfectly honest with you, obviously he had a good uh, race and we noticed, uh, last couple of races that Renault have had a, a pretty good race pace. And that showed once again, as they beat McLaren, um, for the first time, obviously, when was the last time they actually beat McLaren? Um, um I think it was Italy. Yeah, so it's been quite some time. It hasn't happened on, uh, hasn't happened very often this season. So, uh, kudos to Daniel Ricciardo for his performance uh, the last couple of races because he has picked up, and usually, uh, that's not where Ricciardo shows his best form towards the end of this season. So, um, if they can continue that in the last couple of races, I'm sure that will be some somewhat encouraging signs. Um, for 2020 but yeah now pretty pretty solid weekend once again by ricardo absolutely um and now for the rest of the midfield um and also if you want to touch on red bull as well um of course you didn't watch the race properly but in terms of results what do you think of you know red bull mclaren alpha Haas, racing point toro rosso what do you think of those uh of their results in the weekend uh williams williams um, Haas a Haas. Um, I don't, I don't, did Alpha actually do anything? I don't think they're as bad as what I kind of uh, thought they were going to be. Um, by they the were, they were P11 with Raikkonen. Uh, Raikkonen just missing out on points after starting on the soft from 17th, but yeah, they weren't that great. Yeah. Um, Perez, another fantastic drive by Perez. Um, showing once more that he is one of the better drivers in the midfield um, and that racing point really has helped him in the second half of the season once they brought all the upgrades. Uh, stroll is Stroll. Um, Hul Hul where did Hulkenberg finish up, finish up? I can't even remember when I looked it at the results. It was P9. He just about got P9. Uh, P9, very good. Um, and then the, the Torpedo returned once again on the final lap. Um <laughs> Uh, did Gasly get a point? Did he get 10th? No, he... What happened was he got passed by Hulkenberg and I think Perez as well, or Kvyat, and then pitted again, I think, to try and go on the soft tyres or something, and then pitted again to retire with a suspension problem. Oh, okay. So, well, that's that's yeah. unfortunate. That's unfortunate for Gasly. Um, Red Bull... Um... Not too bad, to be honest with you, especially considering the second half of the season, Red Bull haven't really brought too many upgrades, and they've quite clearly fallen off the pace of Mercedes and uh, Ferrari. Well, certainly not as close as what they were, uh, say, around Austria, um, Austria time. So... Yeah, I think that Red Bull have done a, done did a pretty good job there. I don't, I never really expected them to win the Grand Prix. I think if they are going to win a Grand Prix, um, it's going to be next weekend or in two weeks' time, um, the Brazilian Grand Prix, of course, where they are uh, they should have won last year if it weren't for uh, that incident incident between Ocon and Verstappen. But yeah, I think I think that Red Bull will be strong in the upcoming races. But um, 
Have I missed out on anyone else? Uh, McLaren. Oh, McLaren. Oh, yeah. McLaren, of course. Yep. Uh, good result in the end for Lando Norris. Um, everything went relatively smoothly, I believe. No pit stop issues, no major contact for Norris. So that's that's good for him. And, uh, well, Sainz uh, finished behind him, didn't he? What, what happened with Sainz? Why did that happen? Um, he had... It was him and Albon, I think, on the outside of turn one oh. on the exit. And I think Albon made a bit of contact with Sainz. And then Sainz fell behind Ricardo and Norris. And I don't know if Sainz had any damage. But I'm going to assume he may have had some. Because he was never able to catch um, Norris or Ricardo really in the Grand Prix. Okay, well, that, that's fair enough. So... Yeah, th there you go. Sadly, I wasn't able to watch the Grand Prix, but I will uh, won't be missing the rest of the races for the season. That's for sure. Thankfully, uh, no more exams to interrupt the races. So, yeah, it'll be it'll be good to be back and actually watching the race live next time. Absolutely, and I cannot wait for that Brazilian Grand Prix because we should be in for another good Grand Prix. But guys, that is it for the podcast. Thank you guys for coming along and thank you, Nib, for coming on. And yeah, it'll be great to have you back for the race watch along in Brazil. Yep, certainly can't wait at 4.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, whenever it'll be on <laughs> on a Monday morning. But, uh, the Brazilian Grand Prix really never, it, it, it's, there's never a really dull Brazilian Grand Prix. So I'll certainly uh, be looking looking forward to the, to the next race, uh, the Brazilian Grand Prix. Absolutely. And uh, now, guys, before I go, I just want to give a bit of a plug to what content is coming up before the Brazilian Grand Prix. So on Thursday, I'm going to upload my video about Lewis Hamilton and how his sixth world championship was won. And then uh, the day after on Friday, I will upload a video, uh, which is me previewing the driver market going into 2021 and who is going to be contending for what seats in Formula 1. And I think we are in for a very, very interesting uh, driver market next summer going into that season. And then on Monday, next Monday, I'll upload a video detailing the Renault disqualification and what that all means and what Renault's future really is looking like going into 2021 and beyond. And then uh, the following Thursday you know, the day before practice in Brazil, will be my preview for the Brazilian Grand Prix. And then, of course, it will be the Brazilian Grand Prix weekend. So don't forget, guys, to subscribe for that content. Bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there. Or go to my homepage and do it there and hit the notifications bell. Don't forget to hit the like button. Comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what did you think of what we had to say in this video. And also... Don't forget to join the Discord, link below in the description. Follow me on Twitter at Chaz6110. Check out my website, ChazRHD.com. And don't forget to like my Facebook page, uh, ChazRHDF1 it is, on Facebook. But guys, until my video on Thursday, the next podcast and the next Grand Prix, it has been me, ChazRHD. Goodbye.